The Halloween decorations are already making their rounds. All the coffee shop drive throughs are packed with people getting pumpkin spice related beverages. The leaves are turning all sorts of hues between yellow and red, but it's still 70 degrees outside for some reason. Regardless, the snow will fall, if not by December, then probably a shit ton in January and February. So today, I'll walk you through on how to get your car ready for the winter time. I am absolutely hyped right now. I just passed my final exam for a network and cybersecurity class I was taking. It was more like a final project where we had to create a whole risk assessment as a security consultant for a fictitious company. And man, did I think I bombed a few questions. Post a comment below, let me know if you're still in college or taking some extra classes right now. So now, let me run you through on how to get your car ready for winter. Let's start off with the basics. You need to get you some good winter tires. This part is absolutely crucial. The tires are the only contact point you have with the ground as you're driving. Or at least that's what I hope. This is the area where I wouldn't skimp out on and I wouldn't mind putting extra money into. All season tires lack in colder temperatures where winter tires would excel. Also a good reminder that having all wheel drive will not save you if you drive recklessly with all season tires, especially with ice and slush plastering the roads. So please keep your distance and drive safely. I can't explain how many snowstorms I've driven through to get to work and school and I see cars absolutely lining the ditches or I watch the cars in front of me slide right off. I plan on getting some really good ones ordered in when the temperatures, you know, decide to dip below 40 degrees. Now would be a good time to start knocking things off your to-do list of things that you need to have done for your car. And that's starting off with the basics. As much as we would love to have an LS swap as a necessity for winter, we gotta start small. Go through and check your brakes. Make sure you have some good life left in the brake pads as well as the rotors. As ridiculous as it sounds, make sure your calipers actually compress the brakes. Many calipers like to seize up, especially in the wintertime. Or at least the SOP does. I've had to replace both rear ones and they both completely froze up in the wintertime. With the brakes checked up, make sure that you have an oil change done. It's better to get one a bit ahead of time rather than extending that oil usage past its prime into the winter. Check your other vital fluids and make sure it's not time to flush them based on factory specifications. Now is also a good time to see how dirty the fluid might be, which can usually be a good indication that the fluid might need to be changed. For me, I need to do an oil change, change the serpentine belt, and top off the coolant. Let's get to it. My car is absolutely super rusty underneath. If anyone has a spare Saab 9.3 front frame, you know, just laying around, feel free to hit my line. I'll take it right off your hands for maybe a Big Mac and 50 bucks. Also, make sure to grab the right wrench. The drain plug here is a 15mm and I grabbed a 14mm on accident. Grab the drain pan and let it all drain out. Oh, and would you look at that? I didn't drop the bolt. Does that mean I'm a professional yet? Now, while it's draining, I need to go ahead and top off the coolant. I have a warning light on my dashboard that the coolant level is low. Usually, when the temperature drops drastically from summer to fall, you'll encounter a coolant level low light. That is because, well, the temperature is colder, meaning particles are more condensed, hence a lower level of coolant. With that topped off, we can crack open our oil filter and replace it. On the Saab, it's on the top side of the engine under the engine cover. It's a cartridge style filter rather than the typical canister ones that are usually down by the oil pan. The cover only needs three T30 torque screws to be removed. Now go ahead and grab your 32mm socket for the filter and start loosening the oil filter away. This half inch ratchet lost its ratchet sadly, so I just rotate the whole thing in a circle. So don't make fun of me, I already know it's broken. Now the oil filter housing cap cover thingy is slightly underneath the intake. So if you were unlucky like me and the auto zone in your area only had, say, deep 32mm sockets, you gotta take it off and unscrew the rest by hand. Pro tip, before you swap it out, grab a bag and make a bowl sort of shape, and use the box that the filter came in to catch the oil that drips out. The filter did come with a new o-ring, so I slapped it on and after dipping it in some oil so it won't dry out. But the camera overheated supposedly and it didn't record. Once you have the new filter and o-ring, just screw it back and tighten it down. Since it's a European car, we're going to use the German guesstimate torque figure of Gutentight. Get it? Because it sounds like good and tight? Honestly, I don't think there's an actual torque specification made for this. I just hand tighten it. All bad jokes aside, let's move on. Now it's time for the belt. I don't have the tensioner tool and I'm going to try to do it without it. 
On the tensioner for this car, there's a spot where a 3 8 inch drive ratchet can fit. I'm hoping to get it attached and use the trick where you get a wrench at the other end and essentially use it as a mini breaker bar. Here's a quick diagram of what's going on here. The belt is located on the left side of the transversely mounted, or side mounted in line 4. If you look at it facing the left side, we can see only a few points that the belt goes around. The crankshaft pulley, AC compressor, alternator, and finally the belt tensioner. What I'm going to do is ratchet at the belt tensioner to get a bit more leverage and get the belt off. I'm also hoping I can fit my fat hand through and change the belt to the top of the engine after taking the air filter housing off without lifting the car and taking the wheel and the wheel arch liner off. I'm really not in the mood for doing all that work. As you can see, I was able to slide off the belt without the mini breaker bar trick, and it looks like the belt is starting to crack in some places. I couldn't really get the camera to focus to show you. I have a Continental V-Belt as a replacement, and I'll leave that part number in the description below. Time for the belt to go back to its rightful place. Okay, so I wasn't able to get the belt back on through the top, so now it's time to do it the actual way that the Saab service manual recommends. As you can see, there's a hell of a lot more room down here to ratchet and get the new belt on. I mean, honestly, there better be. If you're taking the wheel and the wheel arch liner off, that would be pretty sad. I was able to get the belt on around the crankshaft pulley at the last bit since I couldn't fit my hand around to the AC compressor, and I was assuming doing it that way would be a little bit easier. Now it's time for the fun part, putting everything back together. Whoa, 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 hold on. If we zoom into this freeze frame right here, I completely forgot about the ratchet just dangling from the belt tensioner and proceeded to put everything back together. Thank God I pulled it out through the top before putting the air filter housing back on. That's your friendly reminder to check everything before reassembling the whole mess. By now, the oil should be drained. Time to put the plug back and fill it up. And make sure you put the plug back. I haven't had any instances where I forget to put the plug back before putting the oil in, but I've heard a lot of horror stories. Saab recommends Mobile One 5W30 full synthetic and 6.5 quarts of that good stuff. I got really nervous trying to pour it on camera, and that's why I spilled. I swear I can do way better than this mess, and it's not just an excuse. Now slap that cap back on and we're ready for a test drive. I ended up going for a 30 mile test run and was tired as hell when I came back, so I went to sleep. Everything was pretty much good and normal, nothing to complain about. Today, or well, now the next day, I'll be doing a quick clean and trying out some seafoam injector cleaner. It was on sale, two for eight dollars, and I thought I would give it a shot and test the claims. I'm kind of excited to see what MPG figures I pull. In the city, I average around 23 miles to the gallon, and freeway, I see 30 miles to the gallon on the higher end, and that's when I drive extremely conservatively. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to start the boring part, cleaning the interior of my car. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and learned something new that you can use. Thank you for watching.